Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I am joined by the author and scholar Richard Hingley. Richard is a professor in the Department of Archaeology at Durham University and his research focuses on the history of Rome, including the archaeology of Britain in the Iron Age and Roman periods and the archaeology of the Western Roman Empire. Today, though, we're going to hear all about his new book, Conquering the Ocean, The Roman Invasion of Britain, published by Oxford University Press. So you are the author of Conquering the Ocean, The Roman Invasion of Britain. Do you want to tell us a bit about what the book's about? Yes, it's, it's obviously about the Roman conquest of Britain, but that yeah. takes some explaining because I suppose in the mind of the public, sometimes the Roman conquest is quite a short term thing. You know, perhaps it occurs over a few years. In reality, it goes on for a long period of time. And really the first significant episode is when Julius Caesar comes to uh, Britain. Now, Julius Caesar is campaigning in Gaul, uh, which is largely modern day France. And he decides to go over the ocean to Britain in 55 and 54 BCE. And uh, he doesn't, um, so he, he travels twice with armed forces, but he doesn't actually conquer anything. He, he ends up leaving again with some agreements with leading peoples in Britain, um, and they have to pay Rome tribute, but he doesn't actually conquer anything. Then roughly 100 years later, uh, the emperor Claudius, so Claudius um, was uh, in a difficult position in Rome because the senatorial elite, the people who rule Rome, didn't really respect Claudius. And when he comes to power, uh, Claudius wants a victory. And the best place for <laughs> several reasons for Claudius to do that is Britain. So he sends a general and a large army across the ocean to follow up Julius Caesar, 100 years after Caesar's been to Britain. And he starts the conquest. But really that period of conquest goes on from 43 right down to uh, late the late first century. And at that point, the Romans have conquered most of Britain, um, but they have to withdraw and further campaigns occur. So my book goes right up to the building of Hadrian's Wall, which occurred about 1,900 years ago. So in uh, the 120s. So it covers the whole period from Julius Caesar to the building of the wall. That's longer than I thought. That's a longer period of time than I would have thought. I haven't done a huge amount in Roman history, but I feel like for some reason I didn't think it was such a long period of time. Mm. Is there a reason why that's something that people might think? Yes. I mean, I, I think you have to think about what the Romans were trying to do. Initially... Julius Caesar comes to Britain and Claudius has a very similar interest because Britain is a very distant, fabulous place. I mean, Julius Caesar tells us that Romans really know very, very little about Britain. And um, by the time Claudius invades, they have much more knowledge about the people of Britain because they're in contact with people in the southeast of Britain between Caesar and Claudius. But they leave Britain alone, effectively, and just um, manipulate the, the rulers of the people in southeastern Britain for a hundred years between Caesar and Claudius. When Claudius comes in, he conquers the southeast very quickly. So the whole of southeastern, what is now England, falls to the Romans within a few years. But as they campaign further west, into Wales particularly, and... Mm -hmm when they get into central Britain, the conquest is very difficult. It slows down considerably and they have to ex actually expend considerable effort in conquering these areas. And it takes them to the uh, early 80s to reach um, what is southern Scotland. Right. Now we have to be a bit careful. I talk about Scotland and Wales, but they're modern countries. Mm -hmm. So they're medieval kingdoms and modern countries. We should really talk about Southern Britain, Western Britain, Central Britain and Northern Britain. And I like to make that qualification. Um, they're, they're, they're really medieval and modern terms, those countries, but we can't not use them. 
Um, no, it makes it so that we that know happens, geographically. Mm, mm. Why the Romans get slowed down, you know, in that process is to do with the complexity of dominating all these people mm -hmm. and also the fact they're always involved in military campaigns in other parts of the empire. Right. So they can't send an absolutely massive military force. They actually send tens of thousands of soldiers to Britain, but they can't send hundreds of thousands of soldiers because those soldiers are needed elsewhere in the empire. Of course, so multiple prongs of attack, which is so they don't have the whole force of the army. Was it just a more? Was it also more difficult than they were anticipating, as well? Yeah, I mean, I think there's some indication that is true because uh, at certain times during the conquest, people make statements that they can complete the conquest quite quickly. Um, for instance, one of the governors, so the provincial governors, are in charge of the campaigning. And one of the provincial governors, a very senior Roman man, uh, tells the emperor um, that basically he can complete the conquest of Britain in three or four years. But he's campaigning in Wales, and at that stage, in the, uh, in the 60s, mm -hmm. they haven't conquered any of the central area of Britain or any of what is now Scotland. So we don't know really, the Roman, the Roman military elite were very arrogant. Um, we don't really know whether they thought they could do things which were unrealistic or whether it was just boasting. And in reality, you know, the governor was trying to get the emperor's support by suggesting something that really wasn't practical. Um, I think well, it they, may they just be thought they were that, that they good. Do, well, they do a lot of traveling around. I mean, they, they have an important Navy and the Navy explores the coast. And they also send people out to interview um, people beyond their frontiers, so powerful people in communities beyond the frontiers. They may ha actually only have a very vague view of the geography of Britain until they actually start campaigning further. Right. And perhaps they don't realise how large the island is quite when they start conquering. Sure. So they don't really know how much land that they have left or how many more groups of people they're actually going to come into contact with. They just assume, oh, yeah, we'll be fine, you know, a couple of years and we'll have it all. Well, imperial powers can be like that. I mean, if you read some of British imperial history, it's another interest of mine. Um, you, you have British administrators and commanders who actually think they can do things that are completely improbable when you look at what they were boasting about. Um, imperial hubris or whatever, I suppose. If, if you tell yourself that, perhaps as a military commander, you may, you may be able to do things that otherwise would be very difficult, but it can obviously get you into trouble as well. Mm. One example of that is actually relevant to my book because um, the Romans are campaigning in northwest Wales in AD, uh, 60 CE, mm -hmm. and uh, the governor there has probably gone too far and we get this uprising in eastern England, which is very famous, right. the uprising of Boudicca. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that may be that the governor has actually gone too far and is being too ambitious in conquest. So he's right in the northwest of Wales at Anglesey, mm -hmm. the island of Anglesey, and he seems to have gone too far and he loses control. Right. Stretched a bit too thin. <laughs> mm. Um. Why did you choose to write this book with this topic? Is, is it building on older research or is it just something that you're fascinated about? Well, that's a very interesting question. Actually, it's uh, a new thing for me to write this sort of book. Um, I've written uh, eight books in total, uh, but wow. this is actually a very different book from my earlier research. A lot of my research has been on the history of the way that Roman knowledge is developed. And I actually talk about that in the last chapter of, my, of this book, but it's mm -hmm. only a short chapter. This one is, if you want, a sort of historical narrative. Okay. I'm trying to tell a fairly linear, simple story about the conquest that people can uh, follow very easily. Um, the reason I wrote it really is because when I was young, uh, these sort of accounts were very popular in academia. So we had a whole series of books coming out when I was in my uh, formative years that tried to tell uh, 
the stories about the conquest of Roman Britain and the impact of Roman Britain. But that tradition in archaeology has become very unpopular. <laughs> Archaeologists these days, um, including me, uh, tend to be far more interested in the lives of people, sure. all sorts of people. So our research, this is true of a lot of academic fields, our research tends to focus on quite detailed case studies of the lives of um, men who aren't members of the imperial elite, mm -hmm. and women and children, and we're interested in slaves and uh, agricultural workers. Um, we've sort of lost interest in archaeology in the actions of emperors and senior military men. Mm -hmm. um, ancient historians, by contrast, still uh, focus quite a lot of attention on the activities of the emperors. Mm -hmm. And these things, you know, the emperors drive a lot of what happens in Britain. And I, as an archaeologist, wanted to have a think about whether I could write a synthesis that in integrated the ancient history with the archaeology. So I've tried to take forward quite a lot of the stories of people who aren't members of the imperial elite. So they're women and children or, and auxiliary soldiers, you know, less important mm -hmm. soldiers in my story. But I also think what the emperors believe and do is really fundamental for our oh, understanding absolutely. of the conquest of Roman Britain. So it was a challenge for me to do it. Um, and uh, I'm waiting to see how it goes down with my, <laughs> my archaeologist colleagues and whether they like it or whether they feel it's uh, rather um, it's rather, rather a masculine tale of power, mm -hmm. the conquest of Roman Britain. We can't, we can't yeah. really write it any other way because the people who drive it are men and they're very senior. Um, Absolutely. But I, I think it's very interesting. And I, I also think, you know, people get subjected to the actions of powerful men mm -hmm. and we can try and do our research in a way that sort of looks at other issues but we can't avoid that in the Roman past okay. or in the modern world so some of those things were the things that were really motivating me to write the book it's really it's an I like that the fact that you're still you're not you know disregarding the fact that it, it was the emperor and you know that is the power and that's the reason why that you know they're going across the ocean but then bringing it back to how that affected sort of more normal people is because you're right I feel like a lot of my studies definitely was about the everyday lives and the people that weren't necessarily the you know the topics of the theses in the last 50 years it's definitely been a bit of a shift would you just say that it's because the powerful men are the ones that everyone was just so interested in and there's the most information about them is that why that was always the most popular think... thing to research Yes, I mean, in classical studies, we have um, classical texts and those tend to talk about the activities and lives of the very, very wealthy and powerful. But the classical texts that address uh, the Roman conquest of Britain are all written by members of the male Roman aristocracy. And they tend on the whole to talk about, you know, the actions of their peers. And some of them are quite critical, these accounts. They're not all entirely positive. Uh, they also write about people like Boudicca, who's mm -hmm. an anomaly, you know, because Boudicca is a, a woman and she rebels against Rome. But the people who write about her, we've got two authors, they're both male. Mm -hmm. um, they write about another female leader in Britain called Carton Mandua, who they interpret as a very negative figure. Boudicca is different. She, in Tacitus, actually... He writes two accounts, but one, one of Tacitus's accounts, Boudicca is quite a positive figure in a way. She rebels because she's really very badly provoked by the Roman administration. And that's an attack on Nero, who was the emperor at the time, who was seen as a very bad emperor. But um, that drives a lot of interest in the sort of topics, you know, the elite attitude to Britain and why the Romans conquered Britain. Uh, archaeologists used to follow that agenda quite closely until the 1970s and archaeologists are a bit more critical sometimes of power mm -hmm. um, so classics is a very elite subject you know in Britain or America I'm sure it is in your country too uh, archaeology uh, historically was also practiced by the elite but it's quite inclusive as a subject and we tend to be a bit more critical 
So we've had uh, several generations of people in the archaeology of Roman Britain who, as I've said, have got much more interested in average people. And actually, I started my research really by looking at Roman rural settlement. Right. This is over 40 years ago, and I was look, trying to get a perception of all the agricultural workers and slaves, mm -hmm. as well as the powerful people. Um, so again, you have this attempt to create a balance, a more balanced picture. Um, I think, as I say, we have to be interested in the powerful male elite, but we also have to put that in context. And, you know, I keep coming back to that, don't I? That's really the balance in the book, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to look at the history of Rome and not look at the lives of the emperors and the people that ruled the empire. That's, that would just be an incomplete picture of what was happening regardless of in where you are in the Roman Empire surely <laughs> but then I mean I didn't have to write the book so I could have written a book about I suppose the agricultural economy in Britain I I wrote the book because I'm also really interested in the conquest of Roman Britain obviously I wouldn't have taken on it on board it otherwise and I think uh, the public I know uh, we have novelists who write about the Roman military occupation of Britain and we have a very good uh, series of novels on Boudicca. Uh, there's a considerable public interest, but the archaeological consideration of the conquest, the books are rather out of date. Sure. So I can, I can I, I've looked at up-to-date interpretations of the motivations of emperors, and I've looked at the archaeological information for all sorts of people involved in the conquest. Mm. So it's a much more up-to-date account. So. I suppose if there's a novelist writing a, a, a novel about the Roman conquest of Britain, I'd hope my book would be quite useful in presenting an up-to-date account that's not 30 or 40 years old. That's what we like to hear. We like fresh, new information, new ideas, new ways of synthesising old information. It's, it's great. It's, it's really exciting, really. And so while you were researching it, you said it's like a fairly new topic for you. Did you what did you find the most interesting or the most fascinating or something that shocked you or something yes i mean i it's partly something i i kind of knew already but working it through i think has been um tremendously enlightening that uh, i we've known for quite a while that britain has a very special role in elite roman society and this is why the emperors want to conquer britain um because britain is an island and it's a very special island because there are islands in the Mediterranean which the Romans control too. But uh, when we look at the sea, the Romans had a particular attitude to the sea. Now, they inherited beliefs from the Greeks. And the Greeks um, saw the ocean as endless. So the world was a big island set within the ocean. Mm -hmm. And they had some knowledge of the extent of ocean. Alexander the Great had gone right to the eastern extreme of the world that the Greeks knew about and the Romans inherited these attitudes. Alexander hadn't gone uh, to the west, he hadn't gone west in the Mediterranean very much and he hadn't gone right to um, Spain or the west coast of North Africa. However, another myth is um, Heracles in Greek, mm -hmm. society, Greek tradition or Hercules as the Romans knew him. Hercules was reputed to have sailed right to the west of the Mediterranean and actually to have gone through the Pillars of Hercules, which form the, um, the sort of twin sides of that channel, which goes through from the Mediterranean into the Atlantic. And Hercules was a legendary traveller like, um, like Alexander. Now, the Romans know very little, we're told the Romans know very little about the Atlantic as you go north of Spain. So by the time of Julius Caesar, they've already conquered parts of Spain. But they know very little about the uh, west coast of the Atlantic going up towards Britain. And actually, these traditions of Oceanus, the stories about Oceanus and the endless ocean get attributed to Britain. So Britain's really special role is it's an island in ocean. And actually trying to conquer and dominate Britain is effectively getting the submission of this ancient Greek god Oceanus. Wow. Now, Oceanus was one of the original Greek um, gods. He was a titan. And in Roman society, um, he's very powerful and significant. Now, 
Uh, there's an earlier book which looked at this in some detail by somebody called David Braun, and I found that very useful. But following through the conquest of Roman Britain, right from Julius Caesar to Hadrian, I've managed to find some additional things to add. And I think I've managed to reconceptualize this idea about ocean quite fundamentally. Um, and I also believe deeply that Hadrian's activities in Britain. So Hadrian comes to Britain 1,900 years ago in uh, 122 um, CE, would also deeply informed by the attitude to ocean because Hadrian is drawing on that oceanic propaganda. And perhaps the reason Hadrian's wall is so significant and substantial, you know, it's a very, very substantial Roman frontier, a very famous Roman frontier, is because mm -hmm. Hadrian and the Roman elite have this special attitude to Britain as a barbaric and primitive place set beyond ocean or set in ocean. Um, and that's something that I've managed to follow through in the book. And I, I know it's had a few early reviews which are going on the back of the book. And I, one of the reviewers picked that up particularly because that story about Britain's location in the ocean really um, knits together the whole book, if you want. So I think I found that quite surprising because when I'd started off doing research, that was a vague interest of mine and it became absolutely fundamental really to the book. And I think it's the main issue that, you know, I'm really quite proud of that I've managed to bring out. So all these actions, the reason the Romans want Britain and the reason they do all this campaigning over decades and the reason they have so many soldiers in Britain and the reason Hadrian's Wall is so substantial, all to do with their attitude to Oceanus and wow. the sort of cosmology of the world, if you want. That's fascinating. That is so interesting. And the fact that that, was, that sort of became the foundation after not really, you know, it was sort of in the periphery for you and then it became such a big thing. That's, that's awesome. That must have been such a cool thing to work through. Yes, I mean, I, I think you write books or I write books by doing research and, you know, the ideas gradually cohere. And uh, one of the things that became problematic about some of the books on the conquest of Roman Britain 40 years ago is they became a bit repetitive because people were working on the same materials and perhaps the stories became rather, you know, you read one book and it was a slight update on the previous one. I think one of my advantages writing this book is there's been so long a gap since somebody wrote a book on this topic. Uh, we've had republications of old books. So another thing that motivated me was some of the ancient historians whose work I really like are still quoting archaeologists who were writing 40, 45 years ago. Wow. And my subject, yeah, like you know, I'm, I'm an archaeologist. I work in classics too, but I am an archaeologist. My subject has really moved on, you know, in 45 years. <laughs> yeah, as it's like it's theirs. <laughs> so time to quote some newer motivation. publications. <laughs> I, it's I an updated bibliography going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to show that. And I, again, I think, to be fair to ancient historians, it's because archaeologists haven't really been writing about these topics. I don't think I'm criticising them. I, 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 no. I still find it frustrating. But it's good now that, that now there's a new book to add to the to the corpus of old publications. That's great, you know, some new perspectives with the ones that I'm sure are still great, but something new, a, di a different my, way to look at it. I th my, my research is, uh, a lot of my early research is on the way knowledge is developed. So I'm really, really interested in, I mean, I, I look at uh, things like um, Camden's Britannia, which was published in the late 16th century. And I look mm -hmm. at things through history. So we have some very powerful, influential books published in the Edwardian period about 100 years ago. And, you know, I, I'm not criticizing the, the old books. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of them were, I'm saying they got a bit repetitive. I, I got bored with them if you want, when I was young. I, I wanted something new and different, um, but I'm not criticizing them. There were several books that were really very, very influential. I mean, if I, if I tried to be very grand, I might imagine, you know, I could contribute something like that and I'd be very proud if I could. Um, so I'm not being particularly critical. I, I think that tradition of, you know, new things coming along and replacing other things, they don't really replace them because uh, anybody who's really interested in understanding does go back to old texts too. Because Absolutely. the way our knowledge evolves is really fundamental, isn't it? 
Yeah, for sure. If someone's researching this topic, this subject now, they're not only going to read your book, they're going to look at all the other ones as well. And, just, you know, that, that would just make sense. One, I think I have one more question. Mm. What do you think people should really know about the conquering of Britain? That's a really quite a general question. And I've thought about that quite a lot. Um, my my feeling is really that we need to get a balance. I mean, that's probably been coming through all my comments. But the reason I say that is because my experience of talking to people, and I'm talking about members of the public in Britain and students and fellow academics um, in America and uh, in Europe as well as in Britain, is that people tend to split into two sides. A lot of people seem to have a rather beneficial attitude to Rome. I mean, I, I don't think anybody who knows much about Rome would feel Rome was entirely positive, but a lot of people seem to feel Rome was, you know, what the Romans did for us is a concept which is very popular. The idea they brought us all these things, Monty Python's The Life of Brian has a really good s scene in which, um, you know, Reg is being critical of Rome and one of his followers is going through all these things like sanitation and aqueducts and I don't know what else, all sorts of things which are positive. So what the Romans did for us is a generally very positive view. And it's often nuanced by people, you know, having a critical take on it too. You know, Roman emperors were dictatorial, there were some very bad emperors, etc., etc. Other people, it may be more common in, 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 in the UK, it may be more common in um, Ireland and Wales and Scotland, have a directly negative view about Rome. You know, they were imperialists right. like the English and they dominated people, they killed lots of people, they enslaved people. I think the truth is, you know, we can judge history a bit, I think, but we need to get a balance because Rome introduced um, a lot of order. I mean, they did actually stop people fighting and they probably, well, we can document that they improved the economic productivity of the land. And certain people did cool. very well out of the Roman conquest and made lots of money and got high status. Other people got marginalised and they killed a lot of people and they enslaved millions of people across the empire. Their whole economy was based on slavery. So I think mm -hmm. what I'd say is my book is trying to look at those issues too and get a balance because when we look at Rome, we can take some positive messages from Rome and we can take some negative messages from Rome. And I think it really is important for the public to know that Rome, you know, was a complex thing. If people have this very beneficial view, I think one example I give is Roman reenactment because we have a lot of Roman reenactors. I mean, there are even Roman reenactors in Australia. There are quite a lot in Rome and they're all over Europe and in Brazil, really across a lot of the world. I don't know about China and the Far East. I, I suspect they have their own reenactors from their own history. There may be some Roman reenactors too. But um, they're, they're usually very polite and nice people. And if you go and talk to them, they're very civilised and they'll tell you all about their equipment and what they do. In reality, in the Roman Empire, unless you were somebody pretty important, they'd probably cut your head off. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, we have things that push that positive attitude to Rome. And I, I, I just would like to communicate a more balanced view. And I think that is important because Rome is fundamental and foundational to our societies in the West. I mean, if we look at um, the recent history of America, the, um, the presidents are always compared to the Roman emperors. Mm -hmm. And that's usually a critical, cynical thing, I think. But mm -hmm. Rome just generally has, I think, this more positive um, image. So nuancing that positive image, I think it's something that's pretty important because the world is complex now and it was complex in the past. We need to learn Absolutely. some positive things and the positive things we need to learn from history aren't all positive forces, they're negative critical things too. Absolutely. So that's a rather grand aim for a book I suppose but I think it's something I, I do try to communicate through my research. That's That's a good overall thing to keep in mind for everyone who wants to read the book um, and if they do want to purchase the book there will be a link down below to Oxford University Press um, where they will be able to find it. You know it's been a pleasure writing the book I'd say that I I think books are interesting things to write um, authors have different reactions to writing books 
this one I found very challenging. I, it's a new new thing for me to try and do. And I think the next thing I might try and do is write a novel. <laughs> but I think that might be much more difficult for me. <laughs> I'm seriously thinking about that, that. And that's the only other thing I wanted to mention. Thank you very well, much. Well, that's exciting. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. You too, yeah. Thank you very much. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more on our shop at worldhistory.store, or you can find a link for it under the merch tab down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.